Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Moore. I'm postdoc here at the University of Nottingham, and I'd like to show you something about how we're using ZZ structures to represent uh, bioinformatics information and chemical structures and chemical information. So here we have a ZZ structure for bioinformatics with four top level lists. We have a list of structures, a list of people, a list of pathways, and a list of chemical elements. So starting with the least complicated first, we have a list of people. Um, this is a double alphabeti alphabetized, uh, double rank of values. So we have D.H. Ollendorf, Massimo Malcavati, and so on. We'll come back to where these people appear later on. The next thing I want to talk about is a list of chemical elements. This is a much cut down version of the periodic table, which has just about everything we need for uh, biological chemistry. Of course, we probably need a couple of metal ions, um, a couple of things like chlorine as well. But basically, each entry on the table has the name of the element, its chemical symbol, its place on the periodic table, and its relative atomic mass. For biochemistry, you really only need hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Now, these elements and people are all involved in the structures that I'm interested in. Now, these structures are from a, a period of my life during my PhD, where I did a PhD in computational chemistry, where we simulated uh, the interactions of streptavidin, uh, which is a homologue of avidin, which has the naturally uh, highest occurring affinity for biotin, also known as vitamin K, which is down here. So biotin, desthiobiotin, 2-aminobiotin, and diaminobiotin are all homologues. They're all uh, structurally similar. So let's current, take a walk through the structure of biotin. Uh, next to biotin, I have a little rail cell. A cell tells me there's a different type of information coming up. And let's just switch the view to something which chemists are slightly more familiar with. So we'll just walk through here until we've got, there we go, our atoms as circles connected with lines. And let's just change the view here, so we have stretch vanishing. Now, for all you chemists out here, we're just simply representing uh, covalent bonds. We're not saying anything about the types of bonds, whether they're single, double, or so on. So these are just simple. These um, two atoms or more are covalently bonded together. So biotin starts off with a carboxyl group, has a short carbon chain, and then two pentameric rings. At the bottom of this ring we have a sulfur, at the top we have a carboxy group, we've got two nitrogen atoms either side of the top pentameric ring. Now you notice that all of these cells are yellow. This means that they're clones, and they are clones from the periodic table. So if we're using uh, programmatic aspects of zigzag in order to do things like calculate molecular weights, we can simply go straight back to the periodic table. So I'll just do that now. And we can get the information we need from the head cell from the clone. So here we have carbon. We know it's number six periodic table, and here's its molecular weight. So let's just go back along. So uh, as I said, I've got also desthiobiotin. Now desthio as the chemist amongst you will know, will mean that it doesn't have the sulfur at the bottom. So here on the bottom pentameric ring, we're missing our sulfur. It's so pretty. So again, we've got two iminobiotin. And imino is different in that at the top of the pentameric ring, where the carboxy group was four, we have a nitrile group instead. And diaminobiotin go along, we've broken the top pent pentameric ring and we have just the two nitrogen groups at the top here. Now of course all these things are structurally similar, so one of the things we can do in zigzag is express this as a homology dimension. So we're going to go down here, we can see that we have biotin, and if I just rotate D3, so the Z dimension, until we get to 
d.homology, we can see that all of these are now connected out in three space. And if we walk along, here's biotin, there's thiobiotin, two imminobiotin, and diaminobiotin. This carbon atom is, of course, the same in all of these structures. Now, at the end, of course, it, we have uh, different, slight differences in the structure. So, for example, the sulfur atom, which is not present in desthiobiotin, would not be on uh, dehomology for that particular thing. So if we stepped along, we would skip over desthiobiotin. Uh, there's a slight limitation with the uh, visualizations here, so I'm not going to show that now. Let's move Z back to D3. Now, because avidin and streptavidin are uh, very important structures for studying high affinity systems, uh, there's lots of information about them in bioinformatics databases. So let me just change X here to Swiss prop. Here we go. So, and let's change the cell view back so we're not looking at atoms anymore. It's just slightly more comfortable this way. Okay, so we can see that streptavidin has uh, entries in the Swiss pot database which are called SAV Strav and SAV1 and SAV2. Avidin, which comes from hen egg whites, has avid chick and some smaller structural entries, AVR1, 2, and so on. Um, they're also present, of course, in the PDB database. And so if we just change again, looking at PDB, we can see that um, amongst the entries for Avidin and Streptavidin are AVD, 1 AVE, 2 AVI, and the structure I worked on throughout my PhD, 1 STP, which is Streptavidin. Now, there's lots of information in these uh, entries, uh, of course, things like the crystallographic references and so on, um, and there's also the first paper where all these structures are published. So let's have a look at these papers. So we'll just rotate to the reference dimension, which is d.ref, and we can see that one STP has a, a paper called Structural Origins of High Affinity Biotin Binding to Streptavidin. This appeared in Science in 1989, volume 243, pages 85 to 88, and it was authored by the people uh, we have in our people section. So this was authored by P.C. Weber, Ollendorf, Vendelowski, and Salemi. Now, of course, one of the things that you want to do uh, when you've got uh, all of these references, organize them into a bibliography. So we've got a bibliography dimension. And so the next bibliographic um, entry we have is for 1AVD, and that's a very long title, so we'll just scroll down a little bit so it goes into the foreground. This is the three-dimensional structure of the tetragonal crystal form of egg white avidin in its functional complex with biotin at 2.7 angstrom's resolution. And again, this was in the Journal of Molecular Biology in 1993, volume 231, and authored by these people. Now, in the database, um, as well as having the structure of the main protein, we also have the HEF atoms, so whether or not it's bound to biotin, water, and so on. So again, we have a dimension for that called d.het, and we can see that biotin is a HEF atom for 1STP, 1AVD, and 2AVI. You'll notice that 1AVE is not in this list, because 1AVE is a structure of the APO form, which means that there is nothing bound to it. So that's a little bit about the, how to represent bioinformatics database information in ZZ structures. I want to talk now, whenever I just reset this, so we just need to reset Y to D2. Here we go. About how you can represent metabolic pathways. Now, a very famous metabolic pathway is, of course, the Krebs cycle, uh, which is concerned with glycolysis. So the Krebs cycle starts with glycolysis. From glycolysis, we get pyruvate. And with pyruvate, we combine acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate to get citrate. 
Now the chemical structures again for all of these things are underneath. So if we need to know about them, we can connect them with uh, homology dimensions. Uh, we can find their molecular weight and so on. Now if we just go along the Krebs cycle, citrate goes to cis which goes to isocitrate, which goes to oxalosuccinate. Oxalosuccinate, um, you will take an CO2, a proton, NADH, you'll get NAD+, combine them all together, and out will come alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha-ketoglutarate, add a CoA, NAD+, you get NADH, a proton, carbon dioxide, and succinyl-CoA. Here comes the energy step. Succinyl-CoA we combine with water, phosphorus, and ADP, and we get out energy, ATP, and CoA. Now, of course, the CoA, as we know, is an input into the alpha ketoglutarate. So this is a small cycle within the larger cycle. So we get CoA, NAD+, sucks now CoA. So moving along the cycle, um, a FAD goes to a FADH2, sucks and it goes to fumarate. We add water to get malleate. We do the NAD plus thing again to get NADH, proton, carbon dioxide, and oxalose acetate. And we're back to the start of the chain. Now we might also want to look at various inputs and outputs to the cycle. So here we have uh, in Y, D, in out. So these are inputs and outputs from the cycle. So we come in at acetal-CoA. Citrate will give us cholesterol, fatty acids. From fatty acids, of course, we get acetal-CoA, which takes us back into the cycle again. Citrate will go to cisconotate, isocitrate, and on down the chain. And here we have a loop. So alpha ketoglutarate comes from amino acids, but of course, you also get amino acids from alpha ketoglutarate. Moving along, succinyl-CoA. Uh, we get succinyl-CoA from odd chain fatty acids, and from these amino acids, succinyl-CoA will generate porphyrins. Moving on, fumarate also comes from these amino acids. Malate will give us glucose. And again, oxaloacetate both gives us and comes from amino acids. So you can see that we can actually represent these cyclical pathways as ZZ structures. And we can say interesting things about these pathways and the smaller cycles inside them simply by representing them within the fabric of a ZZ structure. Thank you very much for your attention.